This lesson deals with the Ebers mole equations for a BJT. You can find these notes in the ECE 302 ebook in chapter 3, starting on page 6. Ebers and Mole in the 1950s found the equations for a transistor experimentally. Given our definition of base current, collector current, and emitter current, we could say in general that I sub C plus I sub B equals I sub E, so you could solve for I sub B as the difference of I sub E from I sub C. But Ebers and Mole found that the emitter current and the collector current were the difference of two Shockley equations. They found that I sub E was a Shockley equation associated with the base emitter diode and the differencing with the base collector diode times the scalar. Alpha R is a number very close to 1. Likewise, for the collector current, they found that it was the difference of the same two Shockley equations, in this case, minus the base collector diode and then plus the base emitter diode times the scalar. And again, this number is very close to 1. For the PNP transistor, the equations are actually the same if we reverse every current and reverse every voltage. We define the currents in the opposite direction for the PNP, and then for the voltages, we just simply change the subscript. Working with equations is interesting, but our experience with electronics is with circuits and equivalent circuits. Can we take these equations and express this as a schematic? Well, we know there's two diodes in a transistor for the NPN between the base and the collector and the base and the emitter. Now, when we're in the active region, we forward bias the base emitter diode. We're going to use an F subscript for that one. Call that the forward case. And when we're in the inverse mode, or we call it reverse mode, we forward bias the base collector diode to be in the active region. We're going to use F and R subscripts, indicating the first quadrant and really the third quadrant of our VI characteristics. This diode's got a Shockley equation in terms of the voltage across it, which would be the base collector, and a value of eta, V sub t. And then we have different etas for these two diodes, R subscript and an F subscript to indicate which is which, consistent with this. And then we have a saturation current associated with this diode that's between the base and the collector. Because the base is common for these two, they drop the B, and so we just have I sub CS, indicating this is the base collector saturation current. The same is true here for the diode between the base and the emitter. This would be our saturation current between the base and emitter. We're just going to drop the B. Go back to this equation over here. So got this Shockley equation, which corresponds to this one. And that's equal to the emitter current minus the other Shockley equation times the scalar. Current in here times the scalar sounds like a current controlled current source. We set up a current controlled current source that takes this current I sub R and multiplies it by a scalar, call it alpha R. Then Kirchhoff's laws here says that I sub B is equal to I sub F, which is this term, minus alpha times I sub R, which is this term. Take a look at the collector current. Like we see, it's a difference. Eh? Collector current would equal the negative of this. That's our Shockley equation. And then it has plus the current in the other diode times the scalar alpha F. Again, it sounds like a current controlled current source. So this equation is realized with a diode and a current control current source. We get exactly the same model with every voltage and every current reversed in the PNP. Now we have a schematic that describes the equations of a transistor just like we did for a diode. We have several constants in our two Shockley equations. Let's see if we can put the transistor in different regions and try to solve for those constants. The term alpha f and alpha r are terms that are very, very close to one, and we'll derive an equation for these just shortly. When we're in the active region, we're forward biasing the base emitter junction and reverse biasing the base collector. If we take our Ebers mole equations for the emitter current, and now we forward bias this, that makes this term huge compared to one. This term is going to dominate this expression. And with the base collector being reverse biased, this is a very small number. What we have is just a minus one times this. Our I sub C S and I sub E S are also small numbers. They're in the order of nanoamps to picoamps. And again, alpha r and alpha f are numbers very close to 1. So this equation is dominated by this single term. For the collector current, this again would be reverse biased. This is going to be very small. We just have this term times this, which is again a small number. And then this being forward biased, this is going to be a large number times a small number, but that'll give us something maybe in milliamps. Of these four terms, this one's dominating the summation. If you look at these two equations, the collector current is the same as the emitter current, except there's a scalar of alpha f. We could use that to solve for alpha f. If we could measure the collector current and the emitter current, their ratio would be alpha f. We'd seen that the collector current plus the base current is the emitter current. Collector current is always a little bit smaller than the emitter current. 
these two numbers are very close to each other and sometimes hard to resolve the difference in their ratio. That's why it's very, very close to one. Let's define another term called beta f, f standing for forward. This again is our behavior in the first quadrant. And define that to be the ratio of i sub c to i sub b. From our ebers mole equations on the previous page, we had that i sub b was i sub e minus i sub c, but i sub c is alpha f i e. We could pull out the i sub b and we have one minus alpha f. And now we can solve for beta f. It's the ratio of i sub c to i sub b, but i sub c is equal to alpha f i e, and i sub b is one minus alpha f times i sub b. The i sub b's cancel, and we get that beta f is alpha f over one minus alpha f. Alpha f is a number very close to one. The closer it gets to one, the bigger the value of beta f. For most BJTs, we're looking at a number between 100 and 300. Let's also solve for alpha f. From this equation, we have, we cross multiply, we have one times beta f minus beta f times alpha f equals to alpha f. Let's put this on the other side of the equation. So beta f is equal to alpha f beta f plus alpha f. We pull out the alpha f and we have one times alpha f and then beta f times alpha f. And now we can solve for alpha f by taking this equation and dividing by one plus beta f. Alpha f is beta f over one plus beta f. If beta f is a number between 100 and 300, this number again is very close to one. For the P and P, all the equations are the same. If you learn these equations, you get these sort of for free. So now we're able to take some measurements and be able to figure out some of the constants associated with the transistor. To find relationships for alpha r, let's take a look at the inverse active region, or sometimes called the reverse region, where we're going to reverse bias the base emitter diode and forward bias the base collector diode. So going back to our Shockley equations, if we're going to reverse bias this term, it's going to be very small. So we can neglect this. This is times 1. Now this is going to multiply 1, so that's also a small number. But by forward biasing this, this is going to be huge, multiplied by a small number times a number close to 1. So this is going to be something that would probably be in the order of milliamps. This times this is also a small number. So the four terms, this is going to dominate the expression. Likewise for I sub C, forward biasing this is going to make this huge, will give me a current that's probably in the milliamp range. This times this is small. This being reverse bias, that'll be small times a small number, and then this times this is also a small number. So the four terms, this will dominate the expression. If you look at the emitter current, it's the same as the collector current, except it's multiplied by alpha R. I sub B is alpha R times I sub C, so we could solve for alpha R it would be equal to I sub E divided by I sub C. This equation makes sense, if you remember back to our previous lecture, in the inverse active mode, the emitter and collector change roles. Let's define beta R as minus I E over I sub B. I sub B is entering the base lead of the NPN transistor, and the emitter current is our new collector current. It's actually going in the opposite direction, so I'll put a minus sign here. Well, from our ebert mole equation, we had that IB is equal to IE minus I sub C, but I sub E is alpha R times I sub C. Let's pull out a minus I sub C, so I have a 1, and then a minus alpha R. We can solve for beta R. Minus I sub E is equal to minus alpha R I sub C, and I sub B is equal to minus the quantity, 1 minus alpha R times I sub C. The I sub C's cancel, the minus signs cancel, and I get alpha R over 1 minus alpha R. This is identical to the beta f definition with r replacing f. Let's also solve for alpha r. But from this equation, I've got that 1 times beta r, and I've got minus alpha r times beta r, and that equals alpha r. Solve for beta r, put this on the other side of the equation. So I have beta r is equal to plus alpha r beta r plus alpha r. Pull out an alpha r, and you get a beta r plus 1. And now you can solve for alpha r. It's beta r over beta r plus 1. So it's the same formula as alpha f, with f being replaced by r. We learned the formulas from the previous page, or the forward region, the reverse are basically the same. You can see here also that the p and p have exactly the same equations. Let's see what relationships hold in cutoff. We're going to reverse bias both junctions. This number here is going to be very, very small times a small number, so this is going to be negligible. Likewise, this is going to be a very small number times a small number times a number close to 1. This will also be negligible. What we're left with is I sub E S times minus 1, and then minus alpha R I sub C S times minus 1. Likewise, for the collector current, this quantity here is going to be very, very small times a small number, so this is going to be negligible. 
small number times a small number times number close to one, also negligible. What we've got here then is a plus I sub CS and then a minus alpha F times I sub ES. Experimentally, it's been shown that the term alpha R times I sub CS is roughly equal to alpha F times I ES. Let's define I sub S, this will be our term in spice, to be equal to these quantities. Let's go back to the emitter current. Let's substitute in for I sub ES, that that's equal to I sub S divided by alpha F, there was also a minus sign, and this term here is just I sub S. Get a common denominator here of alpha F. I've got minus I sub S times one over alpha F, and then I've got alpha F over alpha F, pull out a minus sign, so there's a minus sign here. This is our definition of one over beta F. I sub S is a very small number. We're gonna divide that by a number that's between 100 and 300. So we've got a very, very small value for the emitter current when we're reverse biasing both junctions. What about our equation for the collector current? Well, it's equal to I sub CS, and that's gonna be equal to I sub S divided by alpha R. And then we have this term alpha F times I ES, and that's just equal to I sub S. Let's find a common denominator of alpha R. So our first term is I sub S over alpha R. If I multiply this by alpha R over alpha R, I have this term with a minus sign, but this is our definition of one over beta R. I sub S is a small number, and dividing it by beta R is not as big as dividing by beta F. Beta R is somewhere between one and 10. They have a small positive number. We can't say much about cutoff except for this relationship here, where I sub S is going to be a term we're gonna use in our spice model. If you look at the P and P side, the equations are the same. Lastly, let's take a look at saturation, see if we can find any relationships in this region of the transistor. Here we're gonna forward bias both the base emitter and base collector junctions. And that's gonna make this term huge. So this would be a very large number, very small number. This will also be a very large number, and a very small number. So these two terms will dominate the expression. Likewise here, this will be a large number. And this will be a large number compared to this term here, which is just one times a small number. And they have these two terms dominating the four terms. Can't say much about this, just simply the difference of two currents that are somewhere in the milliamp range. The other thing we can say is about the collector emitter voltage. And let me use this over here. The base emitter is here, and the base collector is here. And here's the collector emitter. Collector emitter is equal to minus the base collector plus the base emitter voltage. You can say that the collector emitter voltage is the difference of these two PN junctions. Typically, this is around 0.7 for a silicon transistor, and this is about 0.5, the difference being about 0.2. Get similar equations for the PNP. And these are the Ebers-Mole equations for a BJT.